but all I know is that yeah, it, it did reflect on how media work. Um, that there are certain narratives that you don't touch, you don't question. If there are facts that kind of contradict that narrative, you leave them out. And if they're left out, you would um, keep them left out. You don't put them in. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm talking to Mick Hal, an independent journalist from New Zealand with a pretty revealing story about how propaganda in the West works. And he's here to share that with us. So Mick, thank you very much for coming online and welcome to the show. No, I I would appreciate the invite. Very happy to be here. Uh, Mick, you reached out to me via email and you sent me also the story that happened to you because you were working for a mainstream uh, news outlet uh, RNZ, right? So the the New Zealand's national radio Broadcasting. broadcaster. Yeah, or, yep. Um, until until recently, um, because you were doing your journalistic duties and you fact checked certain things that came from the news agencies, and then that cost you your job. Um, can you give us your story? Yeah, I I will give you a brief background. So I I started at Radio New Zealand, which is uh, the state broadcaster, uh, September 2018. Um, before then, I worked for Australian Associated Press um, as a sub-editor. I've been a reporter for 20 years. Um, I had a background in newspaper uh, journalism in the UK. Um, so I, I basically started at the broadcaster um, with a view to engage meaningfully um, in my work. Um, Part of my job, so I, I had written stories um, and I saw better it as well. So it, it was a hybrid role of sorts. Um, I looked after the website as well um, as the editor for extended periods. Um, and part of that role basically involved processing uh, Reuters copy, copy from the BBC. Um, and what I found with the BBC in particular was um, it couldn't always be relied upon to give a non-biased uh, news perspective. Um, it reflected on many occasions a Westminster perspective on things. And I was well aware of that um, coming from Belfast, um, growing up in a war zone. There, there, there reportage of the conflict was quite skewed um, and it didn't reflect the full facts and there was a lack of context as well which was very important so I saw the same patterns um, with a lot of the copy that was coming through on Latin America, China, um, West Asia and particularly with the Russian-Ukraine conflict. Um, once that started uh, the, the amount of bias that was coming through increased and with it uh, was a responsibility as I saw to fix that. Um, so what I did was I put in context when I thought that a story needed it. I reframed a paragraph if I thought it was skewed to reflect a US State Department perspective. Um, and I basically tried to use Reuters copy. We, we had a choice of two Reuters and the BBC. So I, I tried to um, use Reuters as much as I could. Um, and what I did was, so this, this um, I think it was June last year, the first week of June, there was a story um, and it referenced the Maidan revolution. Yeah. Um, and I had changed the copy to say the Maidan uh, color revolution which more, I thought, reflected the reality on the ground much more than saying that it was, or, you know, the the copy had implied that the Maidan was a popular revolution. Um, it had no context about US interference. Um, and and I, also cha I, I also mentioned that uh, for, Russia had annexed Crimea 
that there was a referendum. Yeah. Regardless of whether the West thought that that was a legal fiction or not, um, it's important context. Uh, and when I did that, um, there was a complaint made. Uh, it, it was from a commentator based in New York um, and a lawyer. He, he basically flagged it up on social media that he, he saw it as um, a propagandized version of events from a Russian perspective, um, that it was Russian propaganda. So he reached out to Reuters. Reuters then sent a, an email to Radio New Zealand. Um, they pointed to uh, a breach of the copy sharing contract uh, because there were changes made without its permission. And then it all blew up. Um, basically, uh, a lot of right-wing people online um, saw it. Uh, right-wing politicians then called for a government inquiry. Um, and it just blew up from there. Basically, I, I can't go into too much uh, for legal reasons, but basically the next morning, um, so this happened, I, I, I think the story went out on the 6th, on the 7th of June, I received um, a phone call from my immediate manager. She asked me if I was responsible for the changes. I said, yes, and I stand by it. Um, and I'm happy to explain why the changes were made. And she basically just said, look, uh, you'll be receiving an email soon asking you to step down because there'll be an inquiry now and it's quite serious. Um, she said that an internal, uh, an, an external uh, strategy to minimize harm to the company would be launched um, and that I should sit tight. Um, so basically after that, a couple of hours after that, there was a story that went out on the Radio New Zealand website that framed, uh, it basically said that I had been stood down, um, that they were investigating how Russian propaganda how they ended up in a Reuters copy and was published on their website. So the way that they framed it um, w was quite sensationalist. Um, they framed it wrong, obviously, because I, in, in my mind, um, I was basically going about my business in the way that I think um, a journalist should. If, if you see something that's not correct, if you see something that reflects a subjective opinion, even though it, it may be the position of the US State Department, it shouldn't be there. It 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 should be um, addressed, which is what I did. Um, I acted in good faith. But this was presented as um, a malign actor, possibly with ties to the Russian Federation, and that I was up to no good. So this created a media storm. Um, it, was a, it was a huge scandal for weeks. Um, it made international headlines. And, and uh, I lost my job and, and also it, it was quite, um, I think it kind of created a chill factor within mainstream media that you don't change any copy, you 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 don't change a narrative, the narrative is there for a reason um, and if you change it you are running the gauntlet. This is, this is very scary and I will ask you more about how the newsroom works and especially the interconnection with the with the Reuters and the other agencies that provide you with these uh, uh, boilerplate um, uh, 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 news stories, right? But let's just for a second look at what cost you your, um, your job. I mean, um, here you can now see my screen, I hope. Um, you 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 wrote about this in several outlets, among others, on your own Substack. And everybody, I recommend you Mick Hall's uh, Substack, where he now publishes regularly. Here is the here are here's the passage that you changed. The original passage reads that the conflict in eastern Ukraine began in 2014 after a pro-Russian president was toppled in Ukraine's Maidan revolution and Russia annexed Crimea with Russian-backed separatist forces fighting Ukraine's armed forces. I mean, anyone who's watching this channel, we, we immediately get goosebumps when we see this because it's so clearly this um, Western-centric framing, um, which, you know, even, even just something like um, a pro-Russian government is, in my view, com 
completely wrong. It was simply a neutralist government, but okay. Then you made edits to this uh, and edited to the conflict in Ukraine began in 2014 after a pro-Russian elected government was toppled during Ukraine's violent Maidan color revolution. Russia annexed Crimea after a referendum as the new pro-Western government suppressed ethnic Russians in eastern and southern Ukraine, sending in its armed forces to the Donbass. This is a pretty minor change in, in terms of how you reframed this. And again, you even left in the pro-Russian elected government. I mean, you put an elected in, which is an important piece of information that it was actually, mm. it was the democratically backed government at the time. Um, and this this was enough to trigger somebody in the US to reach out to Reuters and launch a um, shitstorm, to pardon my French, uh, on you and on RNZ in order to whip everybody back in line with the narrative at a national broadcaster in New Zealand. That's the that's the whole story here, right? Yes. Well, I mean, look, the reason that I was changing the copy, which I, I think if, if you don't change the copy and you know that it's wrong, it's a type of malfeasance, you know, and I, I didn't want to be a cog in the machine. I didn't want to just um, slap the story up on the website um and and leave it that way so there were uh structural bias in the story and i can i try to add some type of context so that um see i i think with a lot of the international news stories by reuters the bbc associated press um it it's it's kind of framed in a way um that obscures what's happening in the world um so there there's like a human, uh, like a, it's kind of like a hermeneutic seal, which means that readers and listeners can't really interpret events in the world and make sense of them. So in a sense, I was trying to break that seal. So the edits that I had included were very, very minor, um, but they were um, attempts to make people think a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I mean, so the original line, that it, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see the original line there, but it, it basically doesn't tell the full story. It says that um, the conflict in the east of Ukraine began in 2014. That, that really doesn't say much. Um, it doesn't show that, it, it, it doesn't really show the roots of the invasion. Um, it it has no historic context that reveals that. So I was basically trying to point to things. Now, if, if it was up to me I, 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 and I wrote the story myself, it would be written in a completely, um, um, it wouldn't be written the, the same way. Um, so I, I thought that the changes were significant in that uh, they basically confronted a narrative that I thought was skewed. Um, so, but I didn't expect the type of response that um, happened then. Um, and I think it reflects how fragile that narrative is. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. it, it, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling to me that something like this, you're just adding context and the context you're adding is not is not wrong, not wrong at all. I mean, it's not, you didn't add anything that was fictional or that that was a lie. You just added more of the issues that actually were going on at the time. Now, uh, two questions about this. The first one is, what is this a standard practice in newsrooms that you get these um, these pieces from Reuters and so on, and then you, you do edits? Um, and is this contract? Are you allowed contractually to do that, or did you? Is was this? Uh, because they're saying it's a breach of contract. Yes. So there was an independent review panel set up um, to look into uh, the changes made, um, and what they found was that nobody had actually seen the contract. M my managers hadn't seen a contract, and when I joined in two thousand and eighteen, I was going i i had saw that my colleagues had changed the rotors copy all of the time um it was standard practice uh 
to say if there was a local story, um, you could merge that with the Reuters story um, so that you could have a local perspective on um, a world story. You know, so that was done. If the BBC had more information that Reuters hadn't, you could merge that. I, I saw that happening all of the time. So there was a precedent for changing the copy. Um, the reasons that I changed the copy weren't the same. Um, so none of my other colleagues were changing the copy because I, I don't think that they were really aware of the issues involved. I, I don't think that they had the type of knowledge that I, I had. I mean, I, I was reading um, scholarly works. I was reading the likes of Mersheimer. I was um, constantly following uh, uh, events. M my colleagues hadn't. M the, the managers that I was working with um, hadn't. Uh, so there, there was an issue with, um, at the review panel, I was asked, well, why didn't you speak to your managers about this? Because you shouldn't be um, changing the copy by yourself. You shouldn't be making those calls. And my argument back was that my managers didn't have a clue what was happening in the Ukraine or, or Russia. Um, so I, I, and also I said that the changes that I made were so minor, I, I didn't think it was an issue, um, but obviously it was. So they, they um, yeah, I, I think that there was a precedent for changing the copy, but Radio New Zealand had argued that there wasn't and that we never changed the copy at all, which is wrong. So there was a standard, there was a standard practice. You followed that practice and obviously, yeah, you didn't think that this was a big deal. Um, you and adding context it's just it's just so extremely revealing that that this would happen to you for trying to reframe something and that the the full might of the of of of, of force came down on you not because you added any lives or half truths it's just because you added more context to a story yeah um, well they didn't why, see it that way yeah why um how many of these, when you looked at these Reuters stories, which ones were the most reliable ones in your personal subjective view, uh, which categories were you almost never changed and which category you thought needed uh, needed editorial uh, uh, input in order to give a fuller story? Can you, can you categorize those? Um, I mean, I think a basic generalization would be if there was a story where the U.S. State Department was in conflict with a state or had a vested interest in a region, th those stories could be suspect because Reuters framed stories in a way that uh, reflected the interests of U.S. foreign policy and the assumptions of U.S. foreign policy. So the likes of China um, and Taiwan uh the likes of the middle east um latin america uh venezuela you know there was a pattern there um and uh yeah and i i think the the thing with the ukraine conflict the ukraine and russia and nato was i was only I, there was a pattern there in terms of there wasn't enough context. So when Reuters, for example, was explaining why Russia had invaded, it, it didn't reflect the Russian perspective that much at all. So what I did a lot, and they looked at, I, I think that Radio New Zealand looked at all of the stories that I had touched. I, I think over five years, there was something like 1,350. Um, and they pointed out 49 that they felt were of concern and had breached standards, uh, as they put it. The vast majority of the context that I added um, to the Russia-Ukraine stories, and, and of those 49, I think 23 related to Russia-Ukraine, I had basically only said stuff like um, that NATO expansion was a factor the minced accords not being uh, um, addressed were a factor. They were they were never implemented, um, and 
the neo-Nazis uh, that were involved in the Maidan coup, that were involved in uh, the siege of the Donbass in the, in, in the East, you know, I had said that they were factors in Russia's thinking um, and they explained Russia's behavior. But I always attributed that to the Russian perspective, you know, but even that was an issue for them because you're not supposed to mention these things. You're not supposed to give a Western readership the real reasons why Russia had invaded. Um, and I found that interesting. Uh, I, I didn't, I, I really didn't see the issue at the time because I thought that I was doing my job. I mean, I, I didn't think that this was a subversive act. I, I didn't think that it was a radical act. I, I was simply um, doing my job as I saw it uh, at the time. And I had acted in good faith. I mean, I, I, I don't have a horse in the race. I'm, I'm not a um, uh, supporter of Vladimir Putin. Um, I, I, I'm basically just um, trying to do my job, but I'm trying to do it in a way where I can live with myself, um, and I was punished for it. But do you do you did you find that among your colleagues, what was their reaction? What were their viewpoints? I mean, the thing is, or the, the what is so difficult for us to understand, especially who who work or are in the social media world and who get their information from social media, and then we look at at, 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 at public broadcasters, we look at at the large newspapers we find that the that the portrayal of reality is quite dumped down quite a lot dumped down to a point where uh, what is being said about who the russians are it's just a caricature right it's yeah. just it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense anymore they're like these evil doers from like some some james bond villain movie that's what they're made of to be and then the thinking part of the globe says like this is probably not what they are there are other reasons let's look at those and people like Mearsheimer and Sachs and so on they are very good at helping us understand what are the reasons of not the caricature but of the actual Russians as far as we can go to understand what's what's happening also with China right and with others I mean it, we we are in a con constant struggle trying to understand why um, actors act in a certain way and you found that you worked on this and try to to rectify that portrayal um and then you got kicked out so you're a prime example for what um what uh, noam chomsky said you know if you held if you didn't hold certain couple of beliefs you wouldn't sit where you are <laughs> so you, yeah and, that's true and, and what about your colleagues i mean do they actually believe in this dumbed down version of russia and are they fine with portraying that or do they also secretly do they also know that well you know that's just how we tell the story it's just how we do our job it's just normal um, what is it? it it's hard to tell i can only speculate um and i can give you some examples of um the conversations that i had with colleagues and i you know my reading of it is that uh, reporters and journalists are like scholars. There is a variation, and a lot of them are just as um, propagandized as the general public. So you'll find that they, there's just a lack of reading. Um, they, a lot of reporters um, would follow the lead of their peers because they don't know much. They would rely on think tank fellows, you know, who um, are paid by, you know, states. And, and um, I remember one incident, there was a BBC report on Russians being sent to the front lines using shovels. Um, can you remember that story? It, it was yeah. absurd um, because they'd run out of AK-47s or whatever. And I kind of laughed at it, you know. And I pointed it out to a colleague, the headline itself, you know. And he kind of looked at me um, and said, is there something wrong with this? And he, he couldn't see how absurd it was. So that, to me, reflected the fact that a lot of reporters just don't really know what they're looking at, which is unfortunate because they're supposed to. Um, it's part of their duties. If they don't know, they look for the facts to stand up a story. Um, they talk to people, but I, I, I think that the framing 
the Western news framing is something that reporters just follow blindly and they don't confront it. They, they, they stick with it because they don't know enough and they also stick with that type of framing because there's a risk in, in not sticking with it. Um, so it's a mixture of the both. I, I, I think smart reporters, smart journalists can see the issues at hand, but because of self-interest, um, they, they just stick with that framing. Um, because they have to pay a mortgage, because uh, they want to pursue their um, careers for uh, and where, their own where interests. Can you explain to yourself where this idea comes from that um, that we have to live up to the good story, that we have to tell the right framing? You know, we cannot. We we must be we must be concerned about yeah. um, how the general public then reads the stories because again these are these are more or less facts but it depends on how you present the facts that then creates the narrative right that leads the reader and the listener into a certain way of thinking about well who's good who's evil who's whose mistake is it and it's pretty clear with the russia ukraine war that there is a very vested interest in western countries of making sure that nobody gets the idea that anyone else can be blamed 100% other than Russia, that you you need to switch off this idea that in a conflict, both probably both sides or several sides make, make decisions that in the end lead to the catastrophe. What you want is 100% blame on one side and the other side needs to be the, needs to be the, 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 the poor victim and yes. the, 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 the white knight. Right, NATO, the, the 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 gallant helper who comes and rescues the victim from the claws of the beast. That's the story. That's that's the frame that we we are in. Um, can you explain yeah. to yourself where in the media profession it comes from that this that there seems to be a lot of people who who are fine with this? Yeah, that does seem to be, and I I like I say I I can only speculate why. Um, but you know when you address a hegemonic version of events, you're running risks. So I think that some journalists who, who do see what's happening in the world are reluctant uh, to report um, in the way that they know that they should. So that's just kind of careerism. Uh, there's another, uh, I guess, subset of reporters and they don't really know enough. Um, but the way I see it is that a journalist's role is to inform the public so that they can form rational opinions to hold their politicians to account. And that's not happening. And the reason that it's not happening is because I guess Western states um, are following the U.S. lead. Their states want to maintain U.S. primacy. And the media has to reflect that in some way. It, it it can't stand in the way. Um, so there are subtle pressures on reporters and there are pressures that wouldn't be so subtle. Once you step across the line, um, they're now letting you know about it. Then, I mean, look, um, I got off lightly at the time. I, it, it was huge for me. You know, I, I, I mean, I didn't have a high profile. I, I was just a guy like in the back room. Um, I wrote the odd story, but I was a sub editor. So this to me was a huge amount of pressure. I, I was under huge scrutiny. I received threats online. There was a lot of speculation as to my motives. Um, I lost my job, you know, there was, and, and I guess I'm blacklisted from mainstream media. I mean, I wouldn't go back, you know, I wouldn't step foot in a newsroom ever again. Um, but even if I wanted to, they wouldn't have me, you know? So I, I guess, uh, to me, it gave me perspective. I always knew what the media was. I wasn't naive to it. They have a societal function, um, and their function is to serve power. And a state broadcaster, regardless of the independent charters that supposedly run them, they they are they basically toe the line. Um, their states' lines in, in terms of U.S. foreign policy. They, they don't usually confront those, you know. Um, so for me, I, I guess you're just looking, you know, what happened to me 
reflects that at the end of the day, if you try um, and do your job properly within the context of the West being involved in a war with Russia or China or anyone else, um, if you give a non-hegemonic perspective, uh, that that wouldn't be acceptable. And you will be, I mean, what they did on me, what they tried to do on me initially was to paint me as a Russian propagandist, that I had subjective opinions that I was um, surreptitiously inserting into stories. Uh, I, I wasn't, I was just being a sub-editor. Um, but that's the way that it was framed. Once they then, so they had a look at my other stories and they found, oh, it isn't just about Russia. This is about China, Latin America, the Middle East, um, you know, workers' rights in the UK even. You know, so they, they had to reframe the the smear on me. They couldn't stand up the Russian propaganda smear. I mean, after a couple of weeks or a week. Uh, so they, they just started to suggest that it was about standards, that I was a subpar reporter, that um, that I wasn't properly supervised, uh, that it was a breach of trust um, and this type of thing. So they, they will get at reporters. Um, they will get at um, journalists in a way that, that ruins their careers. And I think other journalists see that, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's clearly then has a chilling effect. But, you know, the, yeah. your story stands out also for another reason, which is that, yes, the media serves power. And it makes total sense that a national broadcaster um, has a national, like a government friendly perspective. But what you are figuring, what you found out is that through this interconnection with the with the large media corporations, the the agencies, which are foreign agencies, the 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 radio New Zealand doesn't serve necessarily the interests of New Zealand's um, foreign policy. It serves the interest of the State Department and uh, UK Westminster, which is like also just downstream from the State Department, right? In, yes. in a slightly different uh, uh, accent. Um, this the the agencies. How big is the role of these of Reuters and BBC and so on in in terms of providing you guys or providing let's say Radio um, Radio New Zealand with stories? How how many percent of the stories that you report on are actually you get from 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 the agencies? It's extremely high. I mean, I I can't put a percentage on it, but I would assume about ninety five percent. Um, and it's it's largely due to resourcing. Radio New Zealand, even though it's a state broadcaster, um, has a limitation on its funding. Um, it can't send reporters to the front lines in the Ukraine. It it, it doesn't have stringers. Um, so a, as a matter of necessity, it relies on these wire agencies. Um, but what it does is it, it, it kind of layers an, an Anglophile perspective on news stories. So they use um uh yeah they use australian copy as well um the copy from the abc the bbc and reuters so there's like an anglophile perspective that really kind of permeates new zealand society and uh when and, and I, I think this was part of the reason why there was such an uproar and it was seen as such a scandal because even the idea of a U.S. back coup in the Ukraine was just beyond the pale. You know, you you really can't say that. And it was framed as a Russian narrative um, and it was contested. I, I think that was one of the things that Radio New Zealand and the Independent Review panel had argued that you, you can't state as fact something that's contested by the Western powers, even if the evidence is there. You just can't. So you have to give two perspectives. And you can see this um, in Palestine at the minute. You can see that the Israelis tell blatant lies every single day. But the media feels compelled to give him two sides. You know, so there's a false, there's a false balance there. Um, this whole idea of um, due in, impartiality. Mm -hmm. that you have to be impartial it, it's a nonsense you know but it, it really where reporters are falling down and news leaders is if there are contested views mm 
then you have to look at the facts and you adjudicate them. But there's, they, they refuse to do that. Then I think it's partly because of political pressure, but also a kind of a cowardice. They're simply not doing their jobs properly. But it's it, it's not even that difficult, right? You would look at what the Kremlin says about a certain event, and then you report Kremlin says X, Y, Z happened. State Department said no, uh, A, B, C happened. Um, and then you leave it at that, right? That's that's the way you would mm. present both depictions of the same thing. But obviously, that's not what's what's um, wanted at the moment. Maybe never yeah. was. The the, the 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 interesting thing is also that these news agencies they're very good at being at looking at appearing to be factual right they give you a lot of like data points and years and so on and then that leads you to believe that this is an objective um depiction of reality because it's quite boring right and it's not it's not flagged as an opinion piece but all of these pieces are heavily impacted by the opinions held by the people who write them right and camouflaging those and then you are you were fired over um, adding adding what you knew was important in addition, which is which is also a reflection, of course, of your view of events. But um, that your view was then flagged as illegitimate and unprofessional, whereas the unprofessional um, Reuters copy is, of course, by default, uh, um, it, it takes the role of objective truth, which you tempered with. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh... So there's a couple of things. I, I, I wasn't fired. I resigned in the end. After um, a couple of weeks, um, the pressure, the CEO, um, Paul Thompson, had characterized the changes that I made as pro-Kremlin um, garbage. And after that, I, I just said, I'm, I'm not sticking around. I'm, I'm not working for uh, a news group that presents my work in that way, they kind of left me no choice and, and I stepped down. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to have anything to do with them after that. Um, but uh, what 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 I did though, I, I was guilty of a procedural mistake. So when I did make that change that they flagged up um, the first story, I left, in the re I, I left in the Reuters reporter's name and I shouldn't have done that because I had changed his copy. I, I usually would have removed those um, names. So that that was a mistake, but I, I, I mean, from like the 1,300 odd stories that I had subbed, it was a one-off, you know, but it, it was used to present the issue as me being surreptitious and sneaky. And, and I wasn't, you know, like um, I was earnestly going about my business and, I made a mistake in the context of um, being involved in a busy newsroom at, at night. You know, these mistakes happen. But um, like, what well, I think, um, yeah, I I think basically what happened was there was a narrative at work at play, and I had kind of changed that narrative in a way that they didn't like. So it was a political witch hunt in the end. It, it wasn't about standards. Like, you know, I mean, everyone makes mistakes, yeah. you know, especially Radio New Zealand. Um, I mean, but it, I mean, it, it, we, it was a political yeah, mean, issue. The, the, these news agencies and the, the largest ones, the largest ones, including the New York Times, reported the things like 40 beheaded babies, right? Yeah. The president of the United States talked of four, uh, that he had seen with his own eyes pictures of 40 beheaded babies in during October, uh, right after October 7, right? And we know that this was, it was just not, it was just wrong. It was just, just a lie. It was, it just never happened. And yeah. this was reported. The New York Times showed 3D renders of underground Hamas bankers uh, uh, under, um, I think, Al-Shifa hospital, right? And we know this is an, it, it's a made up fabricated lie <laughs> that never yeah. was the case. And then, and then um, firing or making sure that you leave and having that kind of pressure on a, on a reporter who like like you on a on a case like this is just revealing in in how draconian the 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 machine acts in order to protect this fragile narrative of theirs. Um, 
But, but w w what also sticks out with your case is that it is an international web of different different wheels, different uh, cocks that that at that interact in order to make it happen right it was a lawyer in the us who used twitter in order to put put social media pressure on rnc which then picked it up and at least there's le at least several several international actors who then who then led to the storm that that broke over your head yeah i mean it was scary look i i i still don't know all of the facts involved, you know, there was speculation as to how it happened and why it happened. I and 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 I, I think there's a lot of conspiracy theories around it as well. Um, but I tend to think of it in terms of incompetency as well. I think state broadcasters like Radio New Zealand aren't always the most competent. I think that the management and the way that they frame things initially uh, helped to create a storm. Um, that really hurt them as well as me. Uh, so there were mistakes made at the start, but I, I, I think it was a reflexive response from Radio New Zealand. Once they got the initial report, once the complaint was made, they just accepted the framing that it was Russian propaganda. And it was ironic because the first story that they got out, it, it basically assumed that I was a Russian propagandist, that I had put quote Russian propaganda in a Reuters story, you know, which is a very subjective opinion. Um, they didn't speak to me. There was no balance. I, you know, um, I didn't get a right of reply. And and it kind of it created a storm. You know, people were speculating, well, who who is this guy? If Radio New Zealand are saying that this is Russian propaganda, he he must be a spy. Like, you know, they must have um they must know something that we don't um, so there was a level of incompetency here, but there were players in the background, and I, I don't, I really wouldn't want to speculate. Um, but all I know is that, yeah, it, it did reflect on how media work. Um, that there are certain narratives that you don't touch, you don't question. If there are facts that kind of contradict that narrative, you leave them out, and if they're left out you would um, keep them left out. You don't put them in. Um, so, I, yeah, I, it was an eye-opener for me. Even though I kind of knew what media was, I, I, I wasn't expecting the response. And I and the way that media had presented it was really not accurate um, to the point of being very duplicitous. Um, so it, it was... Uh, yeah, it wasn't a pleasant experience, but at the same time, it gave me perspective. If it happened again, I, I'm sure that like um, independent reporters would say the same thing. Um, you know, if it happened again, it it, it wouldn't be. I I wouldn't say it in the same way. I mean, it mm -hmm. it, it was almost like the end of the world for me. Oh. You know, it it was very very intense. If it happened again, it would be like water off a duck's back. You know, you, you kind of move on from it. It is what it is. This is the way the world works. Um, I was a victim. Um, but, you know, um, it, I'm very, I'm it very was kind sorry. of minor. Like, um, I wasn't sent to jail. Um, I, I wasn't sent home to Ireland, you know. And I, and I had those kind of thoughts in my head at the time. I kind of uh, catastrophized a lot. It, and like I said, if it happened again, I would be just, you know, um, I would a, shrug my shoulders and move it's on. A, it's extremely emotionally disturbing something like this when your name gets dragged through the mud like that, and and you get all of these accusations and from 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 so many sides. So I, uh, I'm very sorry that it hap this happened to you. But so what are you what are you doing now? I mean, we have on the one hand, you are now you, you now have your own Substack. You work there, and and Substack has luckily the option that people can pay for your journalism and good there there is a lot of great journalists now on Substack, including the the, the biggest uh, like Seymour Hirsch um Glenn Greenwald I think also writes there and and others oh, I'm not sure yeah. anymore but there's a lot in you're also on Substack people can subscribe to you and what else are you doing in order to like still work in media but be outside the yeah. machine I have a number of research projects i'm i'm involved with canterbury university at the minute um researching media bias in terms of palestine um with a colleague um 
Josephine Vargas. Um, I also work for Consortium News. The good thing about that, I I experienced the worst of New Zealand and the best, and and I also made a lot of friends in the process. You know, when it all broke, uh, Consortium News reached out and they offered me work. So I write for them. I write a couple of stories a month for um, Joe Loria ha has been really, really good to me. Um, and there would be other outlets as well that I freelance for. So it, it isn't, there isn't much money in it, um, but I'm still in the game and um, I'm hoping that, you know, I, I have more success in the future um, in terms of finding um, platforms. But in, in, in the meantime, I'm happy with Substack. Um, I have the freedom to write what I want and it's quite liberating. I'm glad to hear that. Um, do you have any, um, to, to the listeners and people who still occasionally, I mean, we all occasionally have to go back to, to mainstream media and to the big newspapers and, and the, the national broadcast, uh, even if we're just like in a car and, and bored and listen to something. What is your advice to, what's the most important thing to keep in mind when you're listening to stories from public broadcasters, how do you how do we discern um, uh, useful facts from um, you know intentful spinning of a story? Well, I I think that most people these days, well, I think more people these days would filter their news. And I, I've spoke to many people since the Radio New Zealand scandal. Um, who who were really strong supporters of Radio New Zealand, now they say to me that they don't trust it anymore, um, that they used to look at the broadcaster through rose-tinted um, glasses, and that's not the case. So they filter what they hear and, and what they read. And I think a lot of people are best served with that. I would compare what you read with scholarly works. Um, and if it doesn't make sense, then... I would research it myself, but I think that there are I, there are so many independent reporters out there who are amazing. Um, the likes of the Grey Zone, uh, th there's just so many, you know. So I would look for those people, s uh, seek them out, and support them. And the people who don't publish writers on their on their pages. Yeah, um, well, it, it is useful. I mean, I would use Reuters, I would use Associated Press, but again, I would filter what I take from them. Um, if it doesn't make sense, and, and if, if I know it's wrong, uh, I don't use that information, but it is yeah. useful, you know, yeah, like that as a building block for stories. No, you're right. It's 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 wrong to by by default um um say like a certain medium or a certain platform is is always wrong. That's so it's definitely not the case. But it's it's we got to be careful all the time. Yeah. Um, make your your story is um is very important to know about. Thank you very much for sharing it, and I hope we'll talk online here soon again. That's great. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Uh -huh.